Welcome to Nutrition, Hydration and Food Hygiene Training created by EDS. You will need a notepad and pen, concentration and some good listening skills. So what constitutes as a balanced diet? You will have heard throughout your life about eating fruit and vegetables and how it's good for you. And of course that is true. We get all our nutrients um, from a diet when it is balanced. So that means portions of fruit and vegetables, five portions a day is what the government recommends. Apparently it's actually twice that, but they thought nobody would ever achieve it. So five has been the public goal that we all aim for. As well as fruit and vegetables, we need other things to keep us well, keep us energized and keep us healthy. So we have carbohydrates, dairy products, proteins and fats. Now they come in all sorts of different forms and depending on people's preference is how we consume them within our diet. Also really good for energy and give us sustained vitamin levels. So carbohydrates are really good for energy. They give us really strong energy sources. Proteins are, are vital for tissue growth and development and fats as well as again supporting energy and energy storage they also are accountable for hormone production all of these things contribute to our cells being as healthy as we possibly can a calorie breakdown is also dependent on people's preference people's choice about how and what they eat the diet conscious will be very wary of how much they eat and how much of what they eat um, but the elderly aren't quite so calorie conscious. The difficulty we have with the elderly, and specifically what we're responsible for as carers in way of nutrition and hydration for our clients, is trying to ensure that they actually have an appetite, that their appetite is stimulated and enough to consume a good amount of food. The good plate, where there's the demonstration of the mix of carbohydrates you know dairy fruit and veg your proteins is all good and well um but within a good plate there is also some what i would call treat food so chocolates biscuits sweets something that gets the appetite excited and when it comes to your clients that is usually the ticket to success in ensuring that they eat well now there are so many barriers, so, so many barriers that our clients can face in way of eating. Low mood, they're on their own. It's not as interesting to make a meal just for one person. They might have digestive or health issues as they've grown older. Their medications might stunt their appetite. They might not be able to prepare food as well. They might have teeth issues, denture issues, and so the mouth isn't comfortable. They might not be able to work the microwave. They might be traditional cooks that in fact just simply don't want to use the microwave. They might have issues with using a knife and fork or simple things like that. And one of the biggest things comes down to actually that stimulation of the appetite and not doing your own food shopping can be hugely detrimental to your appetite. So what can we do to try and help our clients eat well, eat better? Now, one key thing is portion sizes. So in Britain, we all tend to eat more than we should apparently. We put too much on that plate. Now for us, when I'm generalizing there, I'm talking about us as a staff group who are highly likely to be less elderly and much more likely to be more active and more well. And so we would consume more food because we need to. Um, a lot of it will be indulgence. Lots of us find joy in food, but mainly we, we need more energy than one of your clients is going to need. When somebody's elderly and they're not running about all day, they're, they're perhaps, perhaps they're not even getting out of their chair all day. Their dietary requirements, their energy levels are entirely different. Back to their appetite and how vital it is to ensure it's stimulated, too much food actually does the reverse of that. So if you have that heavy loaded plate, it's not gonna do your client any favors. We need to reel off some of that food, minimize portion sizes, because appetite decreases with age as your calorie intake requirement also does. Support measures that your client also may require. Thickeners, supplements, things that need to be added to their food because they're not getting enough from their routine diet, they're not taking in enough nutrients. 
those support measures can be fairly hard to stomach. They are thick, they are gloopy, they're often incredibly sweet. Uh, it can just ruin the appeal of food and drink for some of the clients. We need to make sure that those needs, if they're present within certain clients, are definitely promoted and supported. Now, there's ways and means of doing that. For me, I think what's really important is that we dress things up as normal food and drink. So if you have got a 40 sip that's prescribed for your client, put it into a glass, put it into a mug. They don't need to be seeing the drinking this medicated supplement. With the thickeners, make sure you take time to really mix it into the drinks, to the soup, so it's not clumpy. It actually makes a consistency it's supposed to make. Use your empathy here. Think about how you would want to be presented with this food if that's if you were in that situation. To ensure we're keeping your clients safe when we are at work, so our responsibilities are to ensure that as we prepare food and we prepare drink, it's done in a clean, sensible way. We need to make sure there's shopping supplies in place. We need to make sure there's any meal planning that could be utilized to encourage the client to interact with us around food. Snacks are usually a really good way of getting people to enjoy what they're eating a little bit more or increase their appetite, sustain those energy levels. And if they're on their own, can they go and get themselves a final cup of tea before they go to bed? It's likely not. So is there any things we can put in place to ensure they can still do that? So perhaps a flask. Make a flask of tea with a loosely tied lid. They can get themselves a cup of tea before they go to bed. We are very responsible for ensuring that we check the food that, that is in place that our clients is in date and is safe to use. You may do different things at home. You may have a yogurt that is two, three days out of date that you, as yourself, would decide, you know what, I'm gonna eat that anyway. What you do at home is your choice. What you do at work is the company's choice in way of keeping your clients safe. And if anything's out of date, we do not use it. That can cause challenges with your clients because like you, they possibly don't see the issue with eating something a couple of days out of date from time to time. The problem comes is in our policy, it doesn't support the use of out of date foods. Out of date foods need to be discarded. If your client insists they want to use this out of date product, then your hands are in the air and they prepare their own food. We can't be involved in that. We do have permission to, to remove out of date food because it promotes safety and it promotes health and well being. That doesn't mean your client's going to understand that. If you're in a situation where there's lots of food you need to remove from a property and you've, you're meeting resistant from your client, you need to ring the office and gain our advice. Let us get involved in that and see what decision we can make. There may be other situations where there's frozen meals which are taken out of the freezer and they may appear out of date. If they were frozen before that expiry date, as we all know, they're fine to use. The difficulty is there, the communication link. So if you are taking a meal out of a freezer to defrost, to be used the next day, please make a note of that on the meal, not anywhere else, affix it to the meal. So a sticky note or a piece of paper or something to explain when you took it out of the freezer and what date. So then people know that they shouldn't be using it over a certain date. Okay, that also obviously saves any unnecessary wastage. These are all the things you're supporting all the time when you're at work, when you're providing these meals and this hydration support to your clients. It's so important, but there is a lot to it. There's a lot more than possibly you may think, but that's what we expect. I just want you to think. So when we're talking about hydration, how much water do you drink in a day? Hopefully it's enough, and by enough we mean eight glasses of water or squash a day. But it's quite hard to do that if you actually think about it. Now, if you are um, an elderly person living on your own at home, are you likely to drink eight glasses of water a day? Because that's what the government says you should drink. It's likely not. There are obviously other ways we can hydrate. So we have teas, coffees, fruit juices, pop, etc, etc. It goes without saying that alcohol does not count towards hydration. It's actually a diuretic, which means it encourages the body to lose water. So that actually does the opposite, as it does caffeinated tea and coffee. So the odd cup of normal tea and coffee is fine. 
within a balanced diet because we're assuming that there's water being consumed as well. If you have clients who literally only drink tea or coffee, which we have many of, it's recommended that they switch that coffee or tea to decaffeinated varieties. Now, it's always worth bringing things like that to our attention because if we can help with something like that, we will. It makes a huge difference to the hydration status of your client. It also prevents really unnecessary, exacerbated incontinence issues. So it's always worth being mindful of what your clients are drinking and how much of it they're drinking. It can be really detrimental to health if we don't drink enough fluid. When it comes to the hygiene of actual food preparation, we have got a fair task on our hands. So we are trying to prevent any contamination within that food. Again, at home, it's easy to manage. We're aware of our sides that we use, we're aware of our utensils, our cleaning products, when we wipe the sides down, etc. In a client's house, that is an unknown environment. We can't control how clean that environment is consistently. What you can control is how clean it is when you're there to use it. So be mindful use your common sense. If you're about to prepare a meal on the side, just give it a wipe first. So you know it's clean before you're preparing food there. If you're in a property which is really unkempt and a wipe of the side isn't really gonna ensure that food product is clean, again, common sense, take down a dinner plate, prepare the meal on a dinner plate and use that as your sideboard, then transfer it to a plate to serve your client. It's all these little things about being mindful when you're preparing food. We need to make sure that we're keeping it away from any sources of bacteria. So that means we're mindful where we put things, we're mindful where we store things in a fridge. So we don't put cooked meats and raw meats on the same shelf in case they contaminate each other. We make sure food is covered. As I say, I appreciate there's probably not tons of Tupperwares and cling film, things like that. There's always going to be a smaller plate and a bowl. We could put it in a bowl, put a smaller plate on top, that is then covered. We don't leave tins in the fridge. Everything in a tin needs to be decanted into something else. We keep animals and insects as we can away from the food we're preparing. So lots of your clients will have pets in the home. We need to control that while we are there. So again, if there's cats tittling and tottling all over the sides, we remove the cat, we clean the side before we then prepare the food. We dispose of waste food and rubbish very carefully. We make sure it goes in appropriate places and we keep bins covered or inside a cupboard when it's in the kitchen and generally keeping everything as clean as clean as possible. You wearing your PPE will be wearing gloves when you're in your client's property. It goes without saying that if you provide a personal care for your client and then it is time to prepare them lunch, dinner, snacks, you need to change your gloves to fresh gloves before you start that food preparation. Most of your general hygiene and infection control is all surrounding your hands. So your hands are what needs to be clean. So always have a spare pair of gloves or two or three on your person before you commence your care call. And please always remember to swap your gloves after doing personal care if you are going on to food or drink preparation. We need to make sure that when we're actually preparing the food, cooking the food, that we are ensuring we're destroying any bacteria that can be present in it. So the reason why we store things so well is because any increased water volume increases bacteria to grow. So we want to make sure that we're heating food really, really thoroughly. We want to make sure that food is thawed if it's frozen before we cook it, unless we're cooking it straight from frozen and that is how we can use it. We need to follow specific cooking instructions. So variable microwave meals, ready meals, will have different cooking instructions on them. You need to look at what they are and follow them. You may find that lots of clients have a mix of ready meals because different family members provide different meals, different foods. We always uh, encourage people to get microwave friendly meals. Lots of families, relatives will buy lovely ready meals but they don't look at the back of the packet and they actually need to be prepared in the oven. We often don't have time to put something into an oven to prepare because they normally take over 30 minutes. So if you've got a meal, a ready meal that is oven cook only and you haven't got the time to cook it, please don't guess how long you think it would take to cook in a microwave. You can't use that meal. You you need to follow those cooking instructions. You'd have to prepare something else instead. 
So do follow that to the letter. If you do have concerns, obviously contact the office or the on-call and we can help you on any moments of specific advice. So when you're coming to your food hygiene side of things, when we're talking about making sure things are cooked properly and thawed properly, that's because there are certain temperatures that food needs to achieve to be safe to consume. So for example, hot food needs to be around 63 degrees Celsius. So that's actually quite hot and it's supposed to keep that hot. So if ever you're at a buffet, as an example, and you've got food under heated lamps, you wanna make sure it feels really, really hot if you're gonna be tucking into that. It's the same with your clients. So if you're making them a ready meal and you're following the cooking instructions, that meal should be incredibly hot in the middle. Obviously, before you serve it, you need to take consideration of that, stir it round, warn the client it's hot, leave it to cool down a little bit if that, if you need to support the client in that way. Be mindful, we're back to that common sense, you need to keep using it. Frozen foods must obviously be frozen, so to stay frozen, they need to be kept probably lower than around 18, minus 18 degrees Celsius, so if they should be frozen, they should be in the freezer. If we have an issue with an appliance or a freezer breaks and the food is defrosting, nine times out of 10, the whole stuff needs to be chucked away. But again, contact the office on call for advice on that. Generally, things that are kept in the fridge should always be below about five degrees. So everything should be cool, but not freezing. If we are heating up food, we want to make sure that we're only doing that one time. So we don't want to be reheating food. We need to avoid that wherever possible. Again, your clients, you can't control your clients. They may choose to finish off that bangers and mash ready meal that you had made them for lunch and they want that going back in the microwave again for tea. Again, that's not something that you can do. That steps out of the policy of safe food hygiene. So again, the client can do that for themselves if they insist, but your responsibility as a carer is to, is to educate and encourage that client to make safe choices to promote their own health and well-being and obviously it would be highly advisable that they actually select you something else for their evening meal we don't reheat food if they are going to insist on reheating that food or you have a relative who brings around a sunday dinner which obviously they cooked at lunchtime and they want you to heat it up for mum dad auntie uncle for tea then we need to make sure it is incredibly hot in the middle incredibly hot and again, caution when you're then serving that food, we don't hand it to the client when it's absolutely scalding hot. Now, a bit of a question, which is always remains a debate between carers, myself included, is when you're washing up pots, when you come to the end of your lunch call and you're making the kitchen nice and tidy again and you're washing the pots you've used, should you dry your washing up or should you leave it to air dry? Obviously, I can't hear your answers, but just shout something out. What do you think you should do? Dry it or leave it to air dry? The answer is leave it to air dry. Now, I know that feels inconvenient for your colleagues that are following on from you, but we're back to that. It's an unknown environment. At home, you know your tea towels are clean. You know how often you wash them. You know what they're used for. In the client's house, you don't know what those tea towels are being used for. They could be used for a hand towel outside the bathroom as well as in the kitchen. And bacteria can host anywhere where it's damp or wet. So we do not use tea towels to dry up pots at your client's house. You leave them to air dry. As a recap, we need to support nutrition and hydration consumption. So basically we're encouraging people to eat and drink as much as they can, but they need to be comfortable for that to be effective. So little portions, little snacks, and we make sure there's some of the, the nice things that stimulate people's appetite. So a couple of biscuits with a cup of tea usually goes down really well. A pudding for after a lunch or a dinner. If you think you need help or advice or you're not sure what to do, then obviously you need to call the office or the out of hours on call. And generally when you're providing your care, it might not feel urgent or something you need to ring in immediately, but just be mindful and when you're considering factors that might be reducing appetite or intake, you will know your clients so well. And we, as the office, will always be so grateful for your input. You ever have any ideas of what might be helping or hindering somebody's consumption in way of nutrition and hydration, please bring them to the table because we're so interested in that information.
Always store and prepare your food carefully. Make sure you put things where they should be and dispose of anything that's out of date. Again, you're meeting resistance with that. Give the office a call and we'll help you.